All right, folks, uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm going to be your glass blower today. Uh, I've got Amber and Hutch helping out in the shop. Uh, and next door, we've got John and Scott over in our teaching studio. Uh, if you folks have any questions while I'm working, just shout them out. I'll do my best to answer them while I work. Uh, again, my name is Jeremy. This is Dragon's Breath Glassworks, and welcome to the Pennsylvania Renaissance Festival. Uh, we're going to make a beer mug for you today, and I got a new toy uh, to play within the shop, a something called a thin mold, um, and it is used to create sort of hexagonal shaped tops on pieces. I've got a vase, a black and red vase over there that has that shape on it. If you want to look at that after the show, it'll be up there. Um, so we're going to start by getting the glass out of the furnace. Now the glass that we're using here is the same glass that's been in use for thousands of years. It's called a simple soda lime glass, made from soda ash, lime, and silica. I've preheated the pipe so the glass will stick to it. And inside this furnace, there's a big ceramic pot called a crucible. In the bottom of that crucible right now, I've got about 60 pounds of molten glass just waiting for me to scoop up and use whenever I want. Now, this isn't enough to start, but I want to show you some things. Uh, first is how hot this glass is. It looks orange, but it's actually crystal clear. You're seeing the heat right now. And if I stop turning the pipe, it starts to flow off of that pipe onto the ground. I don't want that to happen, so I'm always turning the pipe while I'm working. I'm going to get a little bit more glass on top of this. And then I'm going to add coloring by rolling this in chips of glass called frit, F-R-I-T, frit. They are bits of glass, in this case colored purple, with manganese. You could use iron to turn it green or silver for yellow, 14 karat gold would give you pink. Uh, the one you all know, even if you don't realize that you know it, is a mineral that gives you a really dark blue color. Any guess what mineral that is? Shout it out if you know it. Cobalt, <laughs> cobalt blue. Now, I'm melting these chips in, because they are so uh, large, they take a little bit of time to melt in, but the color is also very dense, which for something like a beer mug means I only need to put one layer of it on, which is good because I've got about five different shades of purple in this dish over here. And that makes for a nice uh, depth of color, even with only one layer of color. Now, right now, it's just spots of purple. I'm going to make that a little more exciting by grabbing my tweezers and twisting the surface of the glass. What this is doing is putting movement in the color. Uh, it is letting that color move around. Now, glass coloring is not like paint. It's not going to swirl and blend into a new shade. It'll just move around itself. I have to get it much, much hotter than 2,000 degrees uh, to get that to turn into a new color of glass. Now, there is a sort of secondary effect that I don't want, and that's all this texture. That texture is going to be a problem. I still don't have enough glass to make the size piece I want to make, so I'm going to go back in the furnace and get more. But if I do that with all these dimples and pinches, the viscous material inside the furnace, that glass, is not going to flow into those deep spots, and it'll trap large air bubbles, and that can be a problem. Small air bubbles are not structural flaws. In fact, I quite like the way they look. Um, some people might consider them optical flaws, but that really depends on the period of time you're talking about and the type of work you're doing um, but they can be large bubbles can be structural flaws they can get too close to the surface and blister and then crack and pop and leave little sharp edges on the surface of your piece so we melt away the texture uh, on that glass but leave the movement in the color I can change the shape on this table notice how the glass changes color almost the second it touches that table that's because that steel table is sucking a lot of heat out of the glass. Now this is solid glass. It needs to be hollow before we move on to the next step. To make that hollow, I'm going to blow into the end of the pipe and trap the air inside with my thumb. Pressure builds up. Sorry about that. Pressure builds <laughs> up. It has to go somewhere. My thumb is not going to move. Um, so that air tries to escape the only other way it can, and that's through the glass. So eventually, it takes just a little bit of time it will push that glass out of the way. There it goes, it's starting to push it out of the way, and that's gonna form a bubble on the end of the stick. You should be able to see it getting a little bit larger now, giving us a nice bubble. Now, this shape is great for a lot of things, but for a mug, I like a slightly longer shape, so I'm gonna give it a swing to stretch it. Don't worry, I don't drop the pipe very often. You should be okay. <laughs> Better not, I've got your camera. <laughs> 
So it's not a big change in shape, but now it went from a ball to more like a bullet shape. And that's what I want for uh, this mug that we're going to start. There's not a right or wrong way, but it's what works best for the individual glass blower. And this is the size and shape that I prefer. Now I'm going to let this cool down before I go back in the furnace and get more glass. Um, it's important that if, if this be the right temperature. If it's too hot, it's going to collapse under its own weight and not to start all over. Too cold, and it won't move properly with the new glass when I gather more. Uh, it's pretty cold right now. I can tell it's pretty dark up here in the area called the moil. Um, and if I tap on it, it's a pretty good sharp sound. It's not moving at all. That's really cold. It's only about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. That's cold in a glass shop. We consider that cold because that's the point at which glass stops moving. All right, I'm going to go back in the furnace, gather up more glass on top of this, and then I get to shape it with my absolute favorite shaping tool in the shop, which I will show to you in one second. So I'm getting my second layer of glass. This is fresh 2,000 degree glass coming out of that furnace. It's heating up the core, so I only have a little bit of time to move that new glass around before the old glass heats up. And my favorite tool is ordinary paper that I've soaked in water. I'm going to squeeze that into shape. And the reason it's my favorite is the only way that you can hand sculpt glass without burning yourself. Uh, there are other tools, and they definitely would not have used paper in the Renaissance. They would have used a wooden shaping block, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. But first, I want to show you why this is possible. That steam that's rolling off that paper is creating a barrier between the glass and the tool, protecting the glass from the tool and the tool from the glass. In the Renaissance, they would have used a wooden shaping block like this. Uh, this is a German block, but they make Swedish and Italian blocks that are different shapes than this. The German blocks are round. They work the exact same way. Steam is protecting the tool from the glass and the glass from the tool. They are made of cherry wood. Uh, fruit hardwoods have uh, short, dense grains that burn evenly, and they also resist splitting from being wet and dry repeatedly. Anytime you touch glass with a tool, especially a wet one like the paper or the blocks, you are cooling it down and oftentimes cooling it unevenly. And so we're going to reheat the whole thing before I start shaping and stretching the body of our beer mug. Now, everything up to this point was just to prepare the material to be turned into the mug. This is the first time we're really going to start shaping this uh, into our final shape. So I'm going to get it really hot. I'm going to cool the bottom down because I want to maintain thickness down there. Uh, to make this piece more functional. And then I'm going to inflate the whole thing by blowing into the pipe. And at this point, if you're hot enough, you don't have to blow very hard. It's like blowing out a can. All right. Now that's more round than uh, mug shape, so I'm going to give it a swing to stretch it, just like before, not as aggressively as I did because it's hotter and heavier. So it will move a lot easier. All right. We have to be able to remove our mug from the pipe later so we're going to create a jack line. That is a constriction in the glass that will allow me to remove this later. And that's right up here. This tool here is called the jacks, the primary tool of any glass blower. Now the tip's a little off center, and that's totally fine. I'm just going to let that sag. I'm pushing up on the bottom while the middle sags. And it's a dent, but that's going to go away. But now everything's back on center. You can see there's a lot of extra heat up here. It's still bright orange. That's because it's thicker. Thicker glass holds onto its heat longer. Glass is a poor conductor of heat, and so you can maintain uh, sort of a heat reservoir in your piece by keeping it thick. If glass were not a poor conductor of heat, we couldn't make the things we make without specialized molds. You would need a mold to make every shape because everything would just heat up and move at the same rate otherwise. So, I'm going to inflate that bottom to get that dent out. We'll flatten it the rest of the way. Mugs need to be flat on the bottom, otherwise they'll just wobble around your table all day. All right, I'm going to stretch this out one more time, finish flattening the bottom, and then we'll be able to transfer our mug off of the pipe and work on the other end. Again, we're going to swing it just to stretch it a little longer. I could use a tool to stretch it. I could grab and pull, or I could use the blades of the jacks to push things down while I inflate. But those leave marks behind. And I prefer to do as much shaping with gravity as possible 
to re reduce the amount of tool marks you leave behind. You're going to leave tool marks behind no matter what you do. So, in my opinion, if you can leave fewer, that's great. I'm using a wooden paddle to flatten the bottom. You've got a nice thick base on here. It's somewhere between a quarter and a half inch thick, which is what I want on a mug. The lip is going to be significantly thinner, and so will the sidewalls. But having a nice thick bottom, it gives it heft and it makes it feel more stable and more durable. All right, it's time to transfer our mug body off of the pipe and work on the other end. For that, I need something called a punty. So, first I'm gonna give this a good deep flash of heat. If the mug gets too cold while I'm working, it will crack and shatter, and I don't want that to happen. I'm gonna hang that up right here on our pipe holder. Well, that, there we go. Hang that on the pipe holder, I'm gonna make the punty. A putty is another metal rod with some glass on the end. I'm going to shape that glass into a dome about a sixteenth of an inch off the end of the pipe. And while the shape is very important, the critical thing is the temperature. If a putty is too hot, it will permanently fuse to the piece. And we don't want that to happen. So we're going to cool this with a very precise cooling technique that takes years of training to master. Very precise. I like two or three chuckles. That's usually what I get on that joke. It's totally worth it, though. So uh, I'm going to step around this way so I can reach my water. Normally, I would have an assistant bring me the punty, but I don't have an assistant today. So we're going to fuse those together, give it a little drop of water at the connection point, and hopefully when I give this a tap, it pops right off. Now, if the punty was too cold when I did that, it would not have stayed on the punty or the pipe, and the mug would have just fallen on the ground and probably broken it. I'll clear that pipe out of the way in a moment. My concern is the heat on the mug. That top was getting really cold. It's the coldest part of the piece. If it got too cold while I was doing the transfer uh, and I went back into the heat of the furnace, it would shatter from the thermal shock. So we're going to make sure that doesn't happen. And then I can take a moment, oh, thank you, Hutch, to clear that pipe out of the way. But Hutch did it for me. So now the top of this part, as I said, is the coldest. We're going to make it the hottest. And if it's real thick up there, I might trim it uh, to thin out the lip because I'm going to add a decorative wrap around the top edge. Uh, and that only works well if the piece is the right thickness and evenly uh, shaped up top. So we're going to check that right now. I've got a little bit of heat in there. That way, if it does need trimming, I can tweeze it to thin it out. It definitely needs trimming. So I'm going to pull to thin this out. Now, it's not hot enough to also cut on this heat. Sometimes I get it hot enough to do both. But for right now, we're just going to stretch that thinner. I'm going to heat it up again and cut off that top edge. I've got a pair of what's called duck bill trim shears here. I'm going to cut that top edge. Trimming that away. And now I'm going to add a decorative black wrap around the lip, just to give it a little bit of pop of color at the top. Normally your assistant would bring you this wrap and you would uh, attach it together, but I'm going to do both parts. This is where being a little bit ambidextrous definitely helps when you blow glass. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that ambidexterity is something you can train yourself to have. You don't have to be naturally ambidextrous definitely train that still. I've got to make sure the mug body doesn't get too cold. So we're going to put both in the heat at the same time, being careful not to touch each other yet. And now, let's do one more layer of that black color. I want to make sure it's a nice, densely colored wrap. The black is made with very dense amounts of manganese. It's actually a purple-based black they make. Uh, blacks from iron as well. But this is a purple-based black and not a green base. So, to attach this, I'm just going to touch it gently to the lip and then roll, stretching that out as I do so. And then when we touch back, we just cast away and pop off the excess. You can cut it. A lot of glass blowers do cut that. I just think it leaves a cleaner connection if you cast instead of cut. I'm going to get the top of this hot, and hot enough to stretch open. Uh, it's going to take just a little bit of time. The whole thing had gotten kind of cold while we were doing those steps. How many of you have seen Glassman before today? 
Mm -hmm. you, how many of you have tried glass blowing before? Mm -hmm. Just a couple of you. How many of you would like to try glass blowing? Good, we teach classes. You can take a class right here today in our shop next door. If that's something that interests you, you can stop by over there and talk to Scott or John, and they can get you set up. All right, so we've got that nice and hot. We're gonna fuse that lip fully to the body, and then I'm gonna use the blades of the jacks inside to start stretching it open. Now, I'm gonna take a couple heats to do this. I could probably force it all the way to the sides I want to in one shot, but that risks putting too much torque uh, and pressure on that punty, and that could literally rip it right off. And so, rather than do that, it's just better and safer to get hot again. The hotter the glass is, the easier it is to work with. To a point, you can get too hot, of course. Uh, that's all dependent, again, on personal skill level. Open some more. Now, I could just leave it like that and add the handle, but we're gonna try this new toy out I got. I've got a six point thin mold, which will turn this top instead of round into a, a hexagonal shape. So, uh, we're gonna try it. I've never used it on a mug before. I've done it on wine glasses. Uh, there are a lot of traditional Dutch German style glasses that have that shape at the top, um, but I've never done one in a beer mug, so we're gonna try it. We'll see what it's like. So a little bit hotter. It's gotta be nice and hot to take uh, the, the lines from the mold. If you're too cold, you're gonna get a poor impression from the mold. such a way that it's your your mouth is going to line up with one of those other uh, ridges and not the point. Um, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe that's why you don't see the beer mugs made this way. So, um, Hutch, could you give me a hand here for a second? I guess not. Hutch! Hutch! It's fine. It's fine. Okay. It'll be fine. <laughs> Hutch, could you give me a hand real quick? Just, can you just keep that pipe turning nice and slow? Just, just like that. Perfect. All right, I'm going to make the handle. I've got to be fast. That punny on the mug is going to be cooling down. I've got to have enough glass, the right temperature. While I have to be fast, I can't rush the process. So while I'm in and out of the furnace quick and I'm moving from place to place quick, I have to spend the appropriate amount of time preparing the material. There is no way around that. If the handle goes on too hot, it just blobs and it doesn't make a good shape. If it goes on too cold, uh, you can't cut it properly and you can't attach it. So I'll come all the way back to the end here. I got it now, thank you. Thank you very much. Drop that right there and I think I need to align this with the rib so that it lines up on a flat side, I think. We'll see. So I'm touching that together. And then when I cut, it should fit it. Whoop, and up, whoop, there we go. And then fuse that. Whew, I made that look easy. Okay. <laughs> now, Yes, I think I was correct. <laughs> All right. I uh, quickly gave you a reheat. That punty was very, very cold. It's starting to crack and separate. The, not the piece, just the punty. Um, which means I've got limited time to finish working on this. I'm going to shake this up, make it a more comfortable handle to hold. Normally, I attach the handles right at the lip of the piece. But in this case, I think it will work much better and just show off nicer if it's not attached to the lip. I like it. What do you think, folks? You like it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more quick flash of heat. Just to make sure that no part of this is too cold. And then I'm going to remove this from the pipe, uh, from the punny. Hopefully, it comes right off. I've got 
a very uh, simple tool, just a butter knife, and leave that right there. I'm going to gently tap. And a gentle tap. And it pops right off. Exactly how it's supposed to. Now these gloves are a little cold because it's cold outside. Um, so I'm going to warm them up. I haven't used them yet today. So they're going to take a little bit longer. If I grab that mug with these cold gloves, it's going to crack. So I can show it to you one last time. There we go, folks. You like it? Very nice. Into the box it goes to cool down. It's going to stay in this oven until tomorrow morning. When I'm all done tonight, I start a 14-hour cooling cycle to bring everything in that oven down to room temperature very slowly. That's called annealing, cooling slowly over time to reduce thermal stress. Everything in the shop is made the same way. It goes through the same cooling process. It's all for sale. Um, you can buy a mug like that one if you like. That one I've spoken for, but um, we have other mugs over there if you'd like to pick them up and take a close look and other things with that shaped top as well. So if you have any questions, come on down and ask. Thank you all for coming out and seeing my show. I appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day at the festival. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.